So hello, everyone. So we would like uh, to welcome you to the Optimization Under Uncertainty Workshop. Uh, so this workshop uh, is being uh, conducted as part of the thematic semester, uh, the Mathematics of Decision Making, which is being organized by the Center of Research in Mathematics, the CRM. So uh, originally, uh, the workshop was to take place last year, but uh, we had uh, planned to host everyone in Montreal. But uh, unfortunately, well, the pandemic and all the original plans had to be changed. So we'll be conducting the, uh, the workshop over this week and uh, all presentations will be done online. That being said, so we are very happy to say that almost all original speakers graciously accepted to again participate to the workshop. And uh, overall, I think we have a, we feel that we have a workshop that includes an excellent program with excellent talks and excellent speakers. So uh, as probably everyone has seen the, um, the program, so uh, each day of the week includes talks that are associated with the specific teams. Uh, so starting today with the, the tutorials. So one important point to note is that all presentations will be recorded and made available after the workshop on the YouTube channel of the CRM. So also uh, for the presentation, so we would ask to everyone to keep yourselves muted during the, the presentation and ask your questions at the end. So to ask uh, questions, uh, either do one of the following two options. So either use the raised hand of, uh, of Zoom or just write, simply write question on the, on the chat. And uh, at the end of the presentation, the, um, the chair will go through the list and call you by name so you can ask your, your questions. Uh, one final point, so we have created breakout rooms. So for, uh, so for example, if you want to pursue discussions after a presentation, and these uh, breakout rooms will be made available to, to you uh, after the presentations. Uh, that being said, they will be closed uh, uh, during the presentations. So you can simply join after a presentation to continue uh, discussing. But please note that uh, when the next presentation starts, the breakout room will be, will, will be closed. Eric? Yeah, uh, we wanted to give a, uh, some, some extended thanks to uh, all the people that were involved in organizing this uh, workshop. So first of all, we have to mention the leader, leaders of the initiative of creating this uh, thematic semester, which were uh, Margarida Carvalho and Andrea Lodi. Uh, we also are dear, like really appreciate all the uh, the help of the administrative staff of the Centre de Recherche Mathématique de Montréal, uh, including Virginie Leduc, uh, Flore Lubin, and Hugo Le Tendard, which will be with us uh, throughout the week. And finally, uh, we wish uh, to also thank the organizations that have uh, made this possible, and notably uh, the Centre de Recherche Mathématique and uh, the NSERC, so the Natural Science and Research Council of Canada. Uh, we also have uh, benefited also from the help of Ivado, Cyrelt, and Girard in uh, disseminating, the, disseminating the information about this workshop. So thank you all, all of, all of uh, these instances. And of course, I have to mention uh, the participants, which have relentless accepted to participate and present in this workshop uh, when it was scheduled in 2020, and have further accepted to just give a, to accept an online presentation as being a good outcome of this, uh, of this adventure. Uh, so thank all of you for staying with us and allowing us to make this uh, a fruitful event. Okay, so let's get uh, things started. So uh, first day, we start off with the, the tutorials. And uh, we're quite happy that the first tutorial will be given by Professor Warren uh, Powell. And uh, the presentation is on a unified framework to uh, uh, model and uh, formulate uh, optimization problems under uncertainty. So Warren, you have the, the floor. Great, thank you very much. I appreciate the invitation of uh, Walter and Eric. I'm very excited uh, about this talk. Uh, I'm gonna start off with a series of applications to motivate the range of problems I'm talking about. Uh, by the way, uh, I spent a few years working with the material scientists. So this is a robotic scientist uh, that has to run experiments. And the decision is temperatures, pressures, concentrations, catalysts, whatever the robot does. Uh, and then the uncertainty is the outcome of the experiment. Uh, we could switch to a more familiar application, a ride hailing fleet. Now, 
figuring out the right car to pick up a customer, that's pretty simple. They just find the closest car and then ask the driver if he can do it. But there's a much more complicated problem where you have to uh, offer a, 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 a price and it has to be high enough to attract drivers, but low enough to attract riders. And that trade-off is uncertain. And that's an experiment, just like our robotic scientists, where I have to try a price and then observe the response. And it's a noisy response. Uh, here's another fleet management problem, but very different. Uh, Schneider National, this is the company that started my career. Uh, here we actually have to manage the drivers, so I don't just pick the closest driver, I have to pick drivers that uh, are, are suited for the load, I have to figure out what load to cover, I have to make sure I'm trying to get drivers home, there's a lot of complicated uh, 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 balancing act and a lot of uncertainty, largely where the, it, in terms of the customers calling in loads. Here's another resource allocation problem, but here the emphasis more on the timing of decisions. Nuclear decisions are made a year in advance, gas turbines a day in advance, uh, I'm sorry, steam generation a day in advance, the gas turbines an hour in advance, and then you have battery storage responding in real time to the variations of wind and solar. Uh, managing these uh, energy generation uh, problems uh, in the presence of renewables is a very complex problem. Uh, you have seasonal variations in wind, you have a wide uh, daily and hourly fluctuations. Uh, so tremendous uncertainty, even when you're planning just an hour in advance. Now here's another <coughs> optimization and <coughs> uncertainty. A few years ago, New Jersey was hit by Hurricane Sandy. Um, in the lower right is a, a utility pole that's down. <coughs> Uh, the problem is the utility company doesn't know where the poles are down. Um, they just know where customers are calling in with their lights out, and then they have to go running around trying to find out where these uh, uh, down poles are. So that's the uncertainty of, of, of discovery. Uh, another one here is these are drones that have to fly over water, uh, detecting uh, 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 chemical pollutants, and then they have to send out a ship to clean up the pollutants so you have an information gathering uh, process, as well as a physical mitigation process. Um, and then here's a big complex multi-agent supply chain uh, problem uh, uh, for Pratt & Whitney. They have a, about a, uh, many hundreds of suppliers or a thousand parts, very complex, a lot of uncertainty in terms of how long it takes to make the part. Uh, uh, the capacity of individual vendors will vary. Um, so tremendous uncertainties, as well as the fact that it's a large system. So what we've been seeing is uh, freight transportation, manufacturing, warehousing, supply chains, uh, e-commerce, finance, uh, energy, uh, and then the whole field of health. These are all a uh, wide range of problems that arise in human processes where uh, we have to uh, manage complex systems under many sources of uncertainty. And pretty much any human process, you're gonna have this uh, decisions or optimization under uncertainty arising in, in a rich array. Now, many of these more complex systems, you'll see rooms full of, of computers of people making decisions. Uh, I like to almost think of these uh, control centers as being a little bit like automotive assembly lines. Here's a Tesla manufacturing plant. And as the information goes uh, down, you have people making decisions, acting on the information, much the way robots act on the car. And I think we have to start thinking of these information and decision processes in this way. Now, we have many goals and objectives that we're trying to achieve, and, and it can range from the traditional reducing cost to increasing profits. Uh, to minimizing lives lost or maximizing the strength of material, improving customer service, and a lot of companies, maximizing employee retention is a big deal. Now, as we want to make uh, 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 run better systems, we have to make better decisions. But the first step in making better decisions is you have to identify the decisions you're making. When we work in optimization, we tend to assume that the decisions have been given to us. But when you go into real problems, especially the more complex problems, that's not always obvious. Go talk to somebody doing supply chain management and ask them, what are all the decisions they make? And, they will, and you're gonna get a black, blank stare. And that's very surprising because if you wanna run a better supply chain or a better company or a better health system, uh, you have to make better decisions. Well, the first step is to know what the decisions are. Once you know what the decisions are, you ask the question, how do you make effective decisions? And if you go outside the academic community, 
uh, and, and talk to people, uh, managers and leaders, uh, you'll, you'll get them saying, oh, it seems like we need to turn to artificial intelligence. You know, we need some of that AI. And so there's been a lot of confusion about what AI is. I mean, I think academics understand it, but in the lay community, uh, AI has gone through these, these evolutions from rule-based AI, optimization 1990s. Uh, the, the new AI today is machine learning and especially neural networks. Uh, a few years ago, reinforcement learning has started to make its way into the newspapers. Uh, so what's the next wave? And I'm going to claim the next wave probably should be something called sequential decision problems, where we have to make decisions over time. In this talk, I'm going to propose that we unify 15 distinct fields that deal with dynamic decision making, and I'm going to call the new field sequential decision analytics. So sequential decision analytics includes all of reinforcement learning, but it's broader and a greater emphasis on uncertainty. So I'm going to start with a, a, a brief presentation on what I've been calling the five layers of intelligence. So these are my five layers of intelligence, and at the very top is decisions, and that's what we want to get to. That's what we're going to focus on in this talk. But if you want to go into a complex problem and talk about making better decisions, you've got to talk about all five layers, starting with information acquisition and storage. Um, this is where basic data enters the system, keyboard entry, barcodes, RFID chips, sensors, uh, image sensing, things like that. Then you have to uh, bring that in and store it uh, either on various uh, uh, hardware devices, increasingly it's in the cloud and managed by these uh, modern database software systems. Next, you have to communicate. Uh, you're gonna have to share the information with others. And uh, this is something that's evolved in, in my career from the cell phone that truck drivers had to stop and call in. So now we're starting to see uh, SpaceX putting in their Starlink network. So we'll have a, a, a Wi-Fi globally. And uh, we, we can never minimize the role of this unbelievably ubiquitous device called the smartphone that allows us to talk directly to people no matter where they are. Um, when you're, say, a shipper, one of the big challenges has been, where's my shipment? And uh, visibility platforms have emerged. Uh, Four Kites and Project 44 are the, uh, are the two most prominent. And you can sign up with these, and, and they'll take the responsibility for uh, interacting with the, the shipping companies and, and railroads and trucking companies to be able to track exactly where your shipment is at a point in time. Now, transactions and executions, that's that stage where we have the room full of uh, uh, computers with people making decisions. This is basic accounting and tracking and inventory management and the basic stuff we've taken uh, uh, for granted. By the way, all three of these first layers may seem kind of basic to a mathematical community like ours, uh, but this is uh, the, the focus of a lot of activity right now. And in fact, if you go out to solve a complex problem under uncertainty, that basic layer of knowing the state of the world is probably going to be one of your biggest challenges because you're never going to know the state of the world perfectly. And optimization on uncertainty is often one of the source of uncertainty. I don't know the state of the world. I don't know where my shipment is. I don't know uh, uh, how the market is going to respond to price. I don't know the temperature of the ocean. Uh, I don't know how people are going to respond to drugs. But let's get to the more exciting points. So uh, we all know about learning. <clears throat> I'm not sure how many of you have run into this. Uh, uh, now that I'm the chief analytics officer for Optimal Dynamics, I've run into a lot of people in industry who think the only technology out there is learning and the only tool to solve any analytic problem is called a neural network. I'm not sure how many other of you have run into this, but it's, it's really quite amusing. Uh, I like to describe learning in, in four categories, uh, pattern matching, you know, is this a flower classification, what product should I recommend, uh, what treatment should I recommend for the patient, uh, inference, uh, how will the increase in price affect the market demand, and what's the condition of a piece of equipment, and then good old prediction, given the history, what's going to happen in the future. Uh, now, whenever you do some form of machine learning, and by the way, I'm spending a little bit of time on machine learning, as you'll see, because in the world of, of sequential decision making, this is going to play a major role. Um, machine learning comes in three overlapping uh, flavors, lookup tables, parametric models, and non-parametric models. And pretty much any time you do anything in machine learning, you're talking about one of these classes and maybe a hybrid. Uh, 
So a lot of people will say, well, wait a minute, what about neural networks? Well, neural networks basically fall between parametric and non-parametric. Shallow neural networks are considered parametric and deep neural networks are considered non-parametric. So if you're into that sort of thing, that sort of resolves that. I want to just briefly make a comment about neural networks since I, I have run into people who think that neural networks can optimize supply chains and dispatch trucks. This is a simple news vendor problem where I order a quantity, you get a random demand, I observe profits, which can be quite noisy. And if I do a thousand observations of this and try to fit uh, uh, my expected profit as a function of order quantity, I'm going to get this crazy line. And that's what neural networks do. If you give me 100,000 points, it looks pretty good, but I'm not going to get 100,000 points. Remember, in a news vendor problem, it takes a day to get one data point. So we have to work with small data points, and the underlying problems are often evolving over time. I, I want to estimate this true function, which I happen to know is concave and smooth, but the neural network isn't able to do that. Neural networks have certain problems for which they're phenomenal. Uh, but they do struggle with noise and they struggle with structure. So if you have a problem that's monotone, uh, the higher the price, the lower demand, or concave like our news vendor problem, you're going to be running into difficulties with the neural network. So let's get to the problem we really want to work on, which is decisions. Uh, this is where reinforcement learning falls. If you go to anybody in machine learning computer science, they'll say, oh, machine learning comes in three flavors supervised learning, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. I simply disagree. Reinforcement learning has to do with decisions. And I think decisions are in a different category. They're a different level than just basic learning. And I think that they need to be separated. I'm going to make the case for that. Now, let's take all those decision uh, applications uh, that I referenced before. Behind every one of these problems are decisions. And each one of these boxes represents uh, an example of the type of decision that would arise in the context of some application. Now, if you break down decision problems, uh, I find it useful to divide them between uh, decisions man managing physical problems, uh, how much inventory, uh, where's your, uh, what should your driver do, scheduling nurses and energy generators, financial decisions such as pricing, insurance, and hedging contracts, and information decisions like sending and receiving information, marketing and advertising, running experiments in the lab and testing drugs were all uh, decisions to collect or, or share information. Now, it's important to talk about the different time frames, strategic planning, uh, how many nurses, pilots, drivers should you have, what suppliers should make a part, where do you locate a facility. Uh, tactical planning. I use the word tactical planning to mean decisions you make now, but impact the system in the future. So a truck driver has to say yes to a load now, but it doesn't pick up the load for five days. Or if I place an order from China now, it won't arrive for 90 days. Or what pricing and marketing strategy should I use now, uh, given that my sales are down and this won't impact until the next quarter? And then the real-time decisions are where, where you execute the decision. What a driver to assign to a load now? Uh, what bid do you place on an ad to maximize ad clicks? Or what drug to prescribe for a patient? So I think of strategic planning decisions where we need to simulate decisions in the future that do not depend on the state of the system now. Tactical planning is where you need to simulate decisions in the future that do depend on the state of the system now. And for real-time decisions, I'm going to make a decision now, but I may have to simulate uh, the downstream impact of that decision to understand if that's a good decision. Now, we're all familiar with this language of linear programming and math programming. What's beautiful about this language is it's spoken around the world. You can get a paper from any country on deterministic optimization, and they'll be using basically the same framework, even the same notation. Uh, there's uh, thousands of people uh, graduating every year that know this language, can go take a complex problem like an airline, convert it into language, put it into a package, and out comes an airline schedule. Amazing breakthrough, and it's amazing how much of this all occurred in my lifetime. We may have low dimensional decisions like uh, what do I do out of node two for finding the shortest path or a higher dimensional system of optimizing facility locations, uh, but these were all static deterministic optimization problems. Now, most, uh, in most settings, decisions are made over time, decision information, decision information, decision information, and the information that arrives after a decision is not known when we made the original decision. 
And so that means each of these decisions to be made under uncertainty about the information that has yet to come in, as well as the downstream decisions. So here's an example of an inventory planning problem. I can uh, uh, plan inventory that can arrive quickly, like an e-commerce setting or in the future, after which I have then observed demands. Then I make another decision to order inventory. Then I observe more demands and so on and so forth. So this is the sequencing of information and decisions. Maybe I'm dispatching trucks and I have to assign drivers to loads. And then after I do that, uh, more information comes in in, in in the form of new loads to be uh, uh, moved, or maybe the driver was late, or maybe the driver quit. And this evolves sequentially over time. Uh, testing new vaccines. I have to try different experiments, different dosages, different types of people, and then observe the outcomes of how they respond to the dosage. Or maybe I have a, a traditional financial trading problem where I'm buying and selling assets. Um, uh, and the uncertainty is in the changes in the stock prices. So if I come back to my original set of applications, and then behind all these applications are all these decisions that I showed you earlier, after each of these decisions are made, information becomes available. Okay, now, one of the challenges of these problems is identifying what types of information uh, will be evolving in the future. This is even harder than identifying the decisions. But these problems, if, if you take what you know now and you make an initial decision, and let's say it's a really simple problem like buy, sell, and hold, and the information is the price goes up, down, or stays the same. If we walk this forward in time, we see how quickly these become. And this is a toy problem. This is an utterly trivial problem. So let's talk about how to model these sequential decision problems. Now, anytime we want to do anything on the computer, if you want to take a real world problem and put it on the computer, you've got to speak the language of mathematics. Now, everyone writing out a deterministic optimization model or a machine learning model, they know how to write their problem out mathematically. This is something that they're all taught, whatever textbook you use, basically the same notation. But when you get to sequential decision problems, uh, we don't have this. We lack a standard modeling framework for sequential decisions. This is where we get to my uh, infamous uh, jungle of stochastic optimization. Um, each one of these uh, terms describes different fields. Each one of these fields is, is characterized by a book, maybe a series of books. Uh, there's about eight different notational systems behind this, a uh, range of modeling frameworks, different algorithms, and often motivated by different uh, problem settings. Everybody's got their pet problems to illustrate their technique. So it's really fairly simple how to model. You've got states, decisions, information. At time t, the state is the state of what we know or believe. This is the state of knowledge. Then we have our decision that we make given using the information in the state variable. And then new information comes in that leads us to a new state. <clears throat> Each time we make a decision, we receive a cost or contribution that may depend on the state. Decisions are made with a method that we're going to call a policy. And if you want to use little x for your decision, I'm going to do capital X for the policy. Then I'm going to put pi as a subscript, where pi carries the information about the structure of the function. And the goal is to find the policy that maximizes expected contributions. So I've roughly done this in one slide, but I'm going to use now, it's also, there, there are also times when we don't always index over time. I may want to have iterations, the nth experiment, the nth iteration of an algorithm, the, the nth arrival of a customer. And sometimes I have to do both at the same time. I may want to do the, uh, the, the nth week, uh, but hour t in, in an ad click bidding problem. Now, any sequential decision problem uh, consists of five core components, state variables, decision variables, the exogenous information which arrives after I make a decision, the transition function which describes how the state variables evolve over time, and then finally the objective function. These five elements describe the problems in every single book in the jungle. Okay, so all we have to do is understand and work with these five elements and we're done with modeling. We still have a lot of work to do, but, but this is the core framework. This is the stochastic analog of min CX sub to AX equals B. And at the end of this, we want to find the best policy. I'm going to go through each of these five elements in just a little bit more detail. And then I'm going to give a, a, a illustration in a, in a 
increasingly complex set of inventory problems. So let's start with state variables. In the literature, there's two widely used notations for state variable. If you go into the optimal control community, everybody uses X. Okay, I don't think I have to explain to this community why I'm not gonna use X. I'm gonna use S for state, and that's very common. Uh, it's what's widely used in operation research, Markov decision processes, computer scientists and reinforcement learning picked up on this. Now I'm gonna introduce some new notation. I'm gonna divide state variables into three categories. R is gonna be our resource or physical state. This is gonna be the inventory or the location of a truck, train or plane. Uh, I is gonna be other information that doesn't seem like a resource state. So let's just think of this as any other deterministic information. Very critical is this state variable called B. This is the belief state. In stochastic dynamic systems, it is very common that you're gonna have something that you, you don't know perfectly. These are gonna be parameters and quantities, market response to prices, belief about the status of equipment, how will a patient respond to a COVID vaccine? Uh, let's take my Hurricane Sandy that went through my area. Uh, we have a uh, line down and one of the challenges we have is we have to manage this utility truck. The location of the truck is the physical state. Now I have a lot of other information of people calling in that their lights are out or weather information or flooding. And I'll, I'll just throw that into my, my variable I. And then all of those fractional numbers are probabilities that there might be an outage there. And so those are the belief state. And that's a fairly large vector of, of continuous variables. Uh, decision variables. There are three canonical notations for decisions, A for action, which is widely used in Markov decision processes. It's standard in reinforcement learning. The control people like to use U. It's typically a low dimensional continuous vector, uh, things like uh, velocities and, and forces and accelerations. And operations research, I don't need to explain. X can be anything. Uh, we will have to specify the constraints. I'm gonna specify the constraints at a point in time T. Now policies, once again, I'm gonna take whatever notation I use, let's call it little x, cause that'll be my default. Uh, my policy, I'll call it capital X superscript pi, where pi tells me what type of function it is in any tunable parameters. Now I'm not gonna design the policy yet. And this is a major point of departure in my approach versus what you'll see in all those books in the jungle. I'm gonna introduce the notation for policy and then I'm gonna say, don't worry about it. I'll get to it later. I call this model first, then solve. Uh, this sounds almost obvious because it's what is done in deterministic optimization. We put up a model, then go find an algorithm. Oddly, that is not what's done in stochastic optimization. Everybody comes up and they have a method for solving the problem and then they fit problems to their method. Uh, types of decisions. Uh, there are entire fields of research uh, dedicated to binary, so stopping problems in finance or A-B testing. The finite problems, this is what 97% of computer scientists work on, where X is a set of finite choices, left, right, red, green, blue. And then we have the continuous problems. Uh, in OR, we almost look at X and X is almost always a vector. Uh, trust me, there's a lot of problems out there where X is not a vector, it's just X1 through XM, but there's a lot of problems where it is a vector and it'd be continuous or discrete or even categorical, okay? Uh, I'm not going to limit myself to anything. Exogenous information, uh, the only field that I've seen that has had canonical notation for information is the control theory community. They use little w of t, which is random at time t. I'm going to use capital W, and capital W at t plus one is known at time t plus one. In fact, it's the information that first becomes known at time t plus one. Now, if you're modeling a physical system, you can't call everything W. So what I'm gonna do is say W might consist of equipment failures and customer demands and changes in prices and information about the environment. And I'm gonna pick suitable letters for those, but I'm gonna put hats on them. And every time you see a hat, that's a variable that, so our hat T, is uh, information that first becomes known at time t. So r hat t plus one first became known at time t plus one and it became known from a source outside the system, okay? That means anytime you see a piece of notation for me that's in, uh, indexed by t, that variable is known at time t. And I wish that was absolutely standard. It's not. 
the default notation in optimal control is wt is random at time t, and it's really annoying. Transition functions. Uh, this is another piece of notation for optimal control widely used by engineers and in, in the control fields, just not that widely used in operations research or uh, Markov decision processes. Now, I'm going to use my own notation for transition function. S superscript M stands for the system model or the state transition model. It's a function of state, decision, and information. So here's examples of uh, the inventory RT plus one is RT. Uh, it's a function of XT. It also can be a function of random information, uh, R hat T plus one. Uh, you can have variables like prices that evolve completely independently of any decisions. You can have a variable like demand. It's not really evolving over time. I just observe it. I don't, I don't know how it evolves and we'll, we'll call that a model free system. Now I can also have estimates like the value of, of, of drug X and I can have the mu bar as my best estimate and the precision, which is one over the variance of beta X. So the updating of this is also part of, of the transition function. So the transition function is so widely used in engineering, it's got a pile of different names. The first time I ran into plant model, I burst out laughing. I went, what in the world is that? Uh, uh, a lot of engineers will talk about the plant model or the plant equation. That's for like a power plant or a chemical plant uh, where they're, they're describing a physical production plant. Now, finally, objective functions. <clears throat> objective functions in stochastic optimization are much richer than they are for deterministic. We might want to maximize the cumulative word where I'm summing contributions over time. I might just want to run through a series of iterations and I'd only care about how well I do at the end, like I'm running through an algorithm or, or a set of laboratory experiments. I just care about the final design. I might have to deal with the risk and that risk might be a function of the entire vector of contributions, not just of its sum. And if you go, especially in the fields like computer science, they love looking at regret where they compare the best that you could do versus uh, what I think is the best, uh, but with a known truth. So you choose whatever form of objective function you want. Now, this is sort of our version of min CX up to AX equals B. We have an objective function, which is whatever flavor you choose. You have a transition function. These are the equations of motion. Uh, you have the exogenous information, which is both the initial state and the, the, the W process that comes in. And all of these involve choosing a policy. Okay, so I'm going to spend a lot of time on how to choose policies because a lot of people go, well, how do you choose that? Now, evaluating policies, we can do this theoretically. There's a lot of academic papers that use optimality proofs, uh, regret bounds, asymptotic convergence. But in any sort of realistic problem, we're going to have to uh, probably resort to numerical simulations, either on a laptop or a supercomputer on the cloud. Um, and then there's a lot of problems that you can't simulate and you just have to experience it in the field. And if there's one problem that we need to spend more time on, uh, uh, we need more research attention is how to do uh, uh, optimization of problems where the only way of evaluating it is in the field uh, because this introduces new issues, one of which is that it's very slow. Now, I just want everybody to get used to that if, you, if you're comfortable with deterministic optimization, a, a time index problem that's how, uh, on the left, that's how we would do it. We minimize over the X's, we have the decision variables and constraints. If you wanna make it stochastic, you have to do what's on the right-hand side. And you have to get used to the fact that you're no longer minimizing over X. You mag well, I like to maximize over policies. Uh, constraints at time T are buried in the policy. The policy has to be designed to be feasible at time T. And then anything that involves T in future time periods has to be captured through the transition function. And of course, you need the source of exogenous information. And this could be a stochastic model. It could be an exogenous data set. It could be observations from the field. Here's an example of a paper uh, in energy. Uh, uh, I withheld the authors, but once uh, is a tenured professor at MIT. Uh, here's an equation in the, in the back of the of the paper. Uh, what they're doing is they're optimizing the uh, energy storage, charging and discharging. Uh, the, the green spikes in the upper graph are uh, electricity prices. They're extremely random, highly stochastic. And of course we have our X variables. 
So presumably we're optimizing over X, but there's no expectation, there's no handling of the uncertainty. And I'm not just making fun of one paper, there's lots of these papers. I mean, you, you, if you just go flipping through IEEE journals, it's quite easy to find these. Now, something that uh, I see a lot of in the literature is that people will start off with a problem of summing over time. For example, uh, so you could sum over CTXT, which is a simplified version of that equation from the paper. And a lot of engineers, when it's stochastic, they'll just say, oh, just throw an expectation out in front. And then they think that fixes everything. But that doesn't make any sense because now XT is a random variable. Well, what's very frustrating is the mathematicians will come in and go, yeah, we know that's a random variable. They're functions. You just have to say where XT is FT measurable. And then all the mathematicians give a deep sigh of relief and go, ah, oh, now that's fine. Okay, nothing wrong with that. Yeah, but... At this point, all the engineers go running for the doors. Most uh, classically trained engineers don't know what FT measurable is, and there's no path to computation. I'm going to show you how to fix this really easily. So if you have your deterministic problem uh, at the top and you want to make it stochastic, the first step, there's three steps. The first step is replace XT with the policy. Okay, takes a little getting used to, but every place you see an XT, just put in the policy. It depends on the state, which by the way, by construction means it's FT measurable, but you don't really need to say things like that. Now I do have to put out an expectation. And of course I'm gonna compute that expectation, expectation using uh, simulations, running a simulation, maybe taking an average. But now that whole max over X is I'm gonna replace with max over policies. In a few slides, I'm gonna start telling you how to do that. The policy has to satisfy constraints at time t, and the dynamics are governed by the uh, transition function. So let's walk quickly through a modeling and energy storage problem. Uh, here's a little energy storage problem, and I'm gonna talk through how to model the five components. I like to list state variables first, but when you're modeling an actual problem, you really actually have to do those last. So I'm gonna walk through the other four steps of the problem, and every time I identify information we need, I'm gonna put a red box around it, and that red box is information that has to go in the state variable. And I'll pull all that together at the end. So here's our decision variables with constraints. And on the right-hand side is information, energy from the wind farm, uh, the demand at the building, RT is energy in the battery. That all goes in the state variable. Exogenous information. So by the way, the energy from the wind, that E hat might depend on the energy level today. Like if the wind is low, uh, the change in energy is wind is more likely to increase and vice versa. So the, the E hat actually depends on ET. So we're going to have know that. But the D hat and the P hat, uh, let's say they don't depend on, on the state of time T. Transition functions tend to be full of, of state variables. Anytime your state variable time T plus one depends on information at time T, that information has to be in the state variable. Um, and the objective function, we have to know the price. So what I'm going to now do is pull all that together. So we have the prices, we have the ED and R. So for this little simple problem, I have four dimensions to my state variable. So let's make the problem just a little bit harder. Let's pretend that the price PT plus one depends on PT, PT minus one, and PT minus two. And that means all three of those have to go in the state variable. Now, I have probability friends who like to say, oh, that price process is non-Markovian. Uh, because it depends on the history, PT minus one, PT minus two, but you can make it Markovian by putting all of that in the state variable. I simply disagree. To me, all of it is in the state variable. The vector PT, PT minus one, PT minus two is your state variable because it's all the information you need. So now when we pull our information for the state variable, I have R, D, and E, and then I have PT, PT minus one, PT minus two. Let's make the problem a little bit more complicated. Uh, we still have our three prices, but before theta was known, and now I'm gonna require that I have to estimate theta. So theta now, theta bar is my estimate of theta. It's indexed by time t, because I'm gonna update it at every point in time as new prices come in. I'm gonna use simple recursive least squares. Now don't worry about these equations too much, only that on the right-hand side, I have to know the vector theta bar t, which has three elements in it, and that matrix M is three by three. And if, I if you tell me theta bar time t and the matrix M t at time t, I can execute all those equations. So when I go to pull together my, my uh, 
dynamical system, I now have to put theta bar n m uh, into my state variable. My state variable is now up to 18 dimensions. Okay, not quite done. Uh, so here's our physical state variables, here's our information variables, and here's our belief variables. Uh, this is frequencies modeling. So these are frequencies belief states, not, not Bayesian. Um, now we've looked at three types of learning. Uh, first, we thought the thetas were all known, so there was no learning. Then there was passive learning where theta bar had to be estimated, but it was from exogenous information that, that just came in passively. So what if I, I have a problem where I'm buying and selling energy to and from the grid and um, how much energy I buy or sell, let's say I'm a large producer or consumer. And if I purchase a lot of energy, it might push the price up. It's like selling stocks. Or, or if I dump a lot of energy into the grid, it might depress it. That coefficient theta bar is influenced by, by my decision XGBT of how much energy to send between the grid and the battery. So now I actually have the ability to influence uh, the price. Let me illustrate why this is interesting uh, and challenging using a simple problem where I have demand as a function of price. And let's say these are three possible demand response curves. I don't know which one's true. And here's an average of all of those. Now, for each of the three demand response curves, I would get three different revenue curves. And then this is the average of all of them. Now, how do I go about better? I, I have an average demand response curve, but that doesn't mean that's the correct one. Uh, it, it could be any one of those dash curves. So maybe one of the things that I could do is to say, well, let me start uh, charging prices and getting new data. If I charge the prices that seem to give me the highest revenue, I'm gonna end up with prices all in a cluster. And, and this is not gonna be very useful information for learning the demand response curve. The best way to learn the demand response curve is to charge prices out uh, at the endpoints. Uh, now, the only problem with that is that I may learn my demand response curve, but I'm not making any revenue. That's where revenue is minimized. Uh, what I really wanna do is something in between. Uh, I call this putting it on the shoulders. Now there's a world of uh, evolved theory for how to choose these points. Choosing these points is a sequential decision problem. It is a stochastic optimization problem, widely known as a multi-arm bandit problem. And there's a very specific theory, but it all fits within the framework that I'm describing because I've got the letter, uh, the state variable B in my state variable. Now, I also want to point out uh, a really challenging problem, uh, but this, by the way, has been largely overlooked by the OR community. So here I have my energy problem. I have highly uh, uh, time-dependent demands, and I have rolling forecasts. So here's 24 hours. By the way, this is real-world data from an energy uh, grid operator. Uh, here's the forecast at midnight over all 24 hours. The black line is the actual, which, of course, I don't know until after the fact. Now, every hour, I'm going to get an updated price. And you can see that these are changing quite a bit. Welcome to wind forecasting. It's a very, very stochastic process. Now, this rolling forecast, probably everybody listening to me says, well, that's no big deal. I know about rolling forecasts. You know, every time period, you update the forecast. But this becomes a stochastic process. If I'm sitting at midnight looking into the future, Technically, I need to model this evolution within my stochastic future. And this is just not done in the OR community. So for this problem, I now have an exogenous process that captures the change in the energy forecast, not just the difference between actual and predicted. I mean the evolution of the forecast itself. So for example, uh, ET plus one, the energy at time t plus one is what I forecasted as of time t plus whatever error you get between actual and forecast. That means that that forecast has to go in the state variable. But where do I, now I have to model the evolution of that forecast. So the one period ahead forecast at time t plus one, the one period ahead forecast is the two period ahead forecast at time t plus whatever errors govern its evolution, which means the two time period ahead forecast also has to go in the state variable, and so on and so forth. In other words, at time t, my state variable has to consist of all, let's say, 24 elements. Let's say I'm doing it in hourly increments, all 24 elements of the forecast. So the full vector of forecast has to go in the state variable. 
So if I come back to my uh, problem of pulling together state variables, I now have the full vector of forecast, which means I have both endogenous forecasting, which is where I did my own updating, and exogenous forecasting, in this case, to handle my rolling forecast. By the way, uh, at the grid operator here in my part of the world, this is how it's done. That, that exogenous forecasting comes from a, a German forecasting vendor. Now, modeling uncertainty. We all know in stochastic optimization that modeling uncertainty is a big deal. Uh, I've written a new book I'll tell you about. I've identified uh, 10 different flavors of uncertainty. This is a really big deal. If there's any young people listening to this and you need a career, this is a fabulous career. It's such a big topic, I can't even touch it. So I'm just going to do one slide and say it's really important, and I'm going to move on. Because what we want to do is get to this challenge of designing policies. Now, let me... Before I get into designing policies, let's go back to machine learning and let's remind ourselves what machine learning looks like. Let's say I have a machine learning problem where I have to come up with a function. Let's imagine that I'm trying to predict demand as a function of price. And somebody comes and says, oh, I think I'm going to fit a linear function. And, uh, and, and of course, you want to find the best linear function. And so uh, you, you, you'll do your best linear fit. Now, somebody else could come in and go, wait a minute. Demand isn't a linear function of price, it's nonlinear. You need a S-curve or logistic regression. And of course, we'll fit the best of those. Now, nowadays, somebody's going to come in and say, wait a minute, wait, wait, you, you can fit this with a neural network. And of course, I'm going to caution, yeah, and you're probably going to fit through all the noise. So be careful with this. But whatever you do, you're going to end up picking a function from this family of lookup tables, parametric and non-parametric. And so we have to search over functions. So f here is the type of function, and theta is whatever the tunable parameters. And of course, we also need a, a fitting data set. This is our traditional big data set. Of course, everybody today has big data sets. Uh, I will tell you, I must be the only person out there not working with big data sets. All my data sets really aren't that big. So now let's compare machine learning to sequential decision problems. Machine learning, we're searching over functions. We've got our lookup tables, parametric and non-parametric. Sequential decisions, we're also looking over functions. It's just we call them policies. In machine learning, we have to have our big data set to fit the function. In sequential decisions, we don't have a big data set. We have a model. We have a contribution function. We have a transition function. And we have the model of stochastic process. Cool. So it, it, I find it more natural to compare uh, searching over policies for sequential decision problems to machine learning because both of us are searching over functions. So now the question is, how do we search over policies? So I get a lot of questions of people saying, what do you mean by a policy? Well, a policy is a method that maps a state variable into a decision, any method. Now, uh, I, I realize I have many uh, French speaking uh, participants here, but in the English language, uh, I have come up with 45 different words uh, that all roughly mean policy. These are different ways of saying, here's how to behave, here's how to make a decision. And if you go to tinyurl.com forward slash policies and decisions, uh, I did have a friend from Brazil give me a Portuguese version of this. Maybe somebody uh, French speaking could create a French tab and do a French version of this. Um, so let's talk about designing policies. Now, it turns out there are two fundamental strategies for designing policies, what we call the policy search approach and building look ahead approximations. So let's start with the policy search approach. And by the way, I'm gonna show that each of these two strategies divides into two classes, giving us four classes of policies. So let's cover the policy search classes. So simple examples of policy uh, in the policy search classes is policy function approximations. These are analytical functions that specify what to do given what we know now. Order up to inventory. Inventory goes below some number, order up to another number. Buy low, sell high. A policy function approximation is literally any lookup table, linear, nonlinear model, neural network, non-parametric model, some analytic function. Uh, here's a nice analytic function. Uh, I want to find the best price. So think of that pricing problem before. And um, if you have uncertainty about that demand response, you might end up uh, picking prices near the middle. But one strategy is to simply add in a noise term. And this is called an excitation policy. 
And the excitation policy has a tunable parameter sigma squared. So this is just a, an analytic function where I add in the noise term. Uh, this is widely used in engineering. So this is a form of policy function approximation for a pure learning problem. Uh, energy storage, I wanna buy and sell energy from, from the grid. Buy low, sell high. Uh, that's a simple nonlinear function. Uh, there's the function itself. It's, it's parameterized by two parameters, the, the, the buy point theta charge and the sell point theta discharge. Now I have a two-dimensional theta vector that I have to tune. Uh, I can specify two points and run a simulation or observe from the field and I get a noisy response and I have to optimize over theta. Cost function approximations. Now, PFAs are not new. Everybody works on this has heard of this. CFAs, this is kind of new. Uh, these are parameterized optimization problems. Imagine that you're finding a shortest path to a destination and you think the decision is the path, but I have to also have to decide when to depart on my trip. And if the Google Maps tells me 40 minutes, I might go, you know what? Yeah, but there's uncertainty in the travel time. I'm going to add 15 minutes. Or energy generators, when they're planning for tomorrow, uh, what they're going to do is add in a buffer term. Uh, here's a learning problem, advertising which product act maximizes revenue. Well, my estimated revenue is just an estimate, and maybe it's low because I was unlucky. So a good policy that's supported by theory is to say, well, let's take the estimated revenue plus theta times its standard deviation. Now, that's an optimization problem. I want to maximize over X, so X is a list of 20 or 50 or maybe 10,000 uh, uh, different products. Uh, but now I have to tune theta. Uh, here are uh, different policies. Uh, uh, these are all known as, so we have upper confidence bounding. The one that I just showed you is called interval estimation. Uh, there's a popular one called Thompson sampling. The computer science community loves analyzing these. Uh, each one of these has an arg max. Each one of these has a tunable parameter. Uh, and by the way, you have to tune it. And, and so here I've taken, and I said, well, if I have a budget of 50, I'll get one value of theta. But if I have a budget of 250, I come up with a different value of theta. This is often overlooked in this community. Uh, I think people do it in practice, uh, but it's not addressed formally. And the tuning process is really a big deal. Now, tuning problems can happen in big problems. I could have a trucking problem where I'm assigning drivers to loads. And if I have to assign drivers to loads over time, uh, these evolve over time. But at any one point in time, I might have a simple uh, myopic problem where I'm assigning drivers to loads. And um, I might have a load that's getting delayed because it's not nearby anything. So what I want to do is put on a negative cost. I'll, I'll let tau be, well, how long has that load been uh, sitting around? And I'll put a tunable parameter theta in front of that that encouraged me to go after that load. Now, that's a policy. Now, this policy is a big linear or integer program, uh, possibly. I still have to tune theta. But this idea of tuning an optimization problem, I think, is a, is a, is a very powerful idea and probably one that deserves more attention. Uh, here's another uh, inventory management problem. How much product should I order to anticipate future demands? And I've got uncertainty in market behavior and transit times and supplier uncertainty and product quality. So here's my linear program. Uh, maybe, I'm, by the way, I'm ordering vaccines from, from various places, uh, but I've got these uncertainties. And if I just solve this, I'm vulnerable to the fact that my demand D may not come out that, or maybe the amount that I supply isn't really X. So what I can do is throw in some tunable parameters. So now I have a parameterized policy that then again has to be tuned. Now, I, solving this is now quite easy. Tuning it is hard. So parametric CFAs are actually widely used in practice. Uh, airlines uh, uh, optimize their schedules using schedule slack. Manufacturers put in buffer stocks. Um, grid operators put in, in, in reserves. Uh, uh, to account for the fact that one of their generators may break down and all of us put in extra buffer time on Google Maps. I've put together a web page discussing CFA policies. Go to tinyurl.com forward slash CFA policy. So instead of reading, and now there is a technical paper you can download. Uh, this is joint work with Saeed Gadimi, uh, now teaching at the University of Waterloo. 
uh, go to tinyurl.com forward slash CFA policy. It'll give you a, a quick introduction uh, just there on the web page. So it's fairly easy. I think this is a very powerful idea. Um, now, in order to do the uh, tuning, uh, you have to do some form of stochastic search and you can do derivative based stochastic search or derivative free stochastic search. By the way, derivative free and derivative based stochastic search are both sequential decision problems. So a stochastic gradient method, the decision is the step size alpha. In a derivative free method, the decision is what point on the function to observe. But both of these are themselves sequential decision problems. So you have to solve a sequential decision problem, the stochastic search, to solve your sequential decision problem, which is to tune your parametric policy. Now we also have the look ahead strategies. So uh, let's go to the look ahead approximations. This is where we're gonna make a decision by balancing between the immediate uh, impact of the decision, the cost or contribution, plus the downstream impact. Now, the correct way to write this is this fairly frightening equation. Here's your immediate contribution that you receive now, and there's all the downstream stuff. Now, this is the approach most favored by the academic community. Uh, so it looks frightening, but I'm going to walk you through this because it turns out it's important that you understand this. So I'm going to assume that everybody understands what a decision tree is. Uh, the state node is, that's your decision node, and that's everything that you know at that point in time. X is then the various decisions. Now remember, in my world, X can be a vector. So don't, don't, don't start assuming that this is one of these frogs jumping among uh, lily pads problems. I have to find the best X, which also has to consider uh, downstream uncertainty. So I have an expectation over the first uncertainty. And then I have all that random stuff in the future. Now, there's two issues that are really sort of complicated here. The first is that max over pi. The max over pi, that policy is, this is what's telling us what decision to make for every one of those decision nodes in the future. Now, designing this is hard. And this is gonna be one of the biggest challenges if I'm gonna use this approach. But then I have this expectation that is uh, over all the future expectations. And obviously that's completely uncomputable, but Secretly, we know at the end, we're going to use Monte Carlo simulation. So that, that doesn't frighten me as much, but that pi, that max over pi is, uh, is, is going to be a challenge. Now, once again, I'm going to decide the look ahead approach. I'm going to divide it into two fundamental cat categories. The first of these is based on value function approximations. I can take this piece and say, look, this is just a function of ST plus one. Let's call it a value function. This is what's done in dynamic programming and Markov decision processes. And there are problems where you can solve this exactly. Uh, in OR, we're mostly uh, uh, familiar with problems where S is, is a discrete state. And if you can compute that, I can get an optimal policy. Uh, this is Marty Putterman's wonderful book. Uh, the fact is we generally can't. Uh, usually we just can't get that value function. We don't have problems with discrete states. So we can approximate. And this has been traditionally known as approximate dynamic programming and we use powerful uh, uh, machine learning methods. You still have that ugly expectation there. Uh, that can be really annoying. So I found years ago, oh, but we, we can use what's called the post-decision state variable. That's the state SXT immediately after you make a decision X, but before you see the exogenous information, now there is no expectation. Now we have a deterministic function and that's great because now uh, as long as that V bar and C have appropriate structure, X can be a vector here. It can be a big vector. I've solved problems where X has, you know, 100,000 uh, uh, variables in it. Now, if you're from computer science, you're going to lump all this together and call it a Q factor. And Q factors are like value functions, but uh, they depend on the state and the action. And by the way, generally you can see why and their actions are discrete. They don't handle uh, uh, vector value uh, decisions, but this is the world of reinforcement learning. Now, uh, here's an example uh, of an energy storage problem. I've got, you know, dozens and dozens, maybe a, uh, several hundred batteries spread around the grid. By the way, these, these look like truck trailers, but these are how they store batteries on the grid. Now, let's say I have the value of energy in each one of these batteries. Uh, what I'm going to do is, is pull these off to the side and run a simulation forward in time. 
And then I'm going to iteratively do this over and over again. And over the iterations, I'm going to learn these value functions. Now, I happen to know that these value functions are piecewise linear uh, and concave. Uh, and that really helps me. So that's why I'm not using a neural network. I'll get that, that goofy curve that I showed you earlier. Now, this tends to work pretty well. You don't get perfectly monotone improvement, but you, it tends to get better and better. Uh, I have a lot of success with this. This is a technology we use at the foundation of uh, the company that I'm now with, Optimal Dynamics, although that's done in a trucking setting rather than energy. Here's an actual uh, plot of uh, energy for the PGM grid. Uh, the little blue and green circles, you see those mostly around the coast, uh, that's energy storage. And in this run, we're not using energy storage. And any of the uh, rectangles that are co co a reddish color, uh, and, and especially a dark red, that's where congestion is happening. So this is a grid that's not running well. So now what we did is we used approximate dynamic programming to plan the energy storage across the grid. So here we see much bigger circles because I have a lot of energy. This is at the exact same point in time in the simulation. And you can see that we've gotten most of the red out. We've really reduced the congestion uh, uh, through the intelligent use of uh, energy storage. Now, I have to tell you, approximate dynamic programming is great. It's a lot of fun. It great, makes a lot of great papers. I've got a 600 page book and I spent 20 years of my life and I am here to tell you, it doesn't always work. It's not a panacea. In fact, I'm gonna go so far as that it usually doesn't work. Now, of our four classes of policies, I like to say uh, the last class, the direct look head, this is what you use when all else fails and all else usually fails. So in transportation logistics and many of our problems like Google Maps, you'll find that we're planning ahead. We're not using a value function. And that's because VFAs, either they don't work or they're just hard, they're complicated. The problem with look ahead policies is now you have this messy problem that's really hard to solve. So we simplify, we create what's called a look, an approximate look ahead model. Notice that I'm doing the same state action information. I've put tildes on everything and everything has a double time index. So the first index T, that means I'm solving the problem at time T. And the second index T prime is I'm looking forward to time T prime in my look ahead model. Now we're gonna have all kinds of various approximations. I'm gonna simplify the information process. I'm gonna simplify that policy. Um, uh, I'm going to limit the horizon. I'm not going to go as far out. I'm maybe going to make some simplifications to my state variable. I might even simplify my decisions. Uh, I've identified six classes of approximations. The simple ones, horizon truncation, stage aggregation, like two-stage, outcome aggregation, that's sampling, discretization. The last two are the most interesting ones. Uh, the first is the policy restriction. That's that pi tilde. So I'm using a look ahead policy, but inside my look ahead policy, I need a policy within the policy. And I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm gonna use some creativity when I design that. Uh, and then finally, dimensionality reduction. This is the most subtle and often we do it without realizing it. It's amazing how often we've got a look ahead model and we've ignored or simplified something without, uh, without realizing it. Here's a little example. This is my energy storage problem before, where I have the, all the different variables, including the various forecasting variables, the theta and M tildes and the rolling forecast. Now, usually what, I, I have to tell you what this means. To have those forecasting means as I do the look ahead, I'm updating my estimates as I look ahead, or I'm getting updates to the rolling forecast. Usually people don't do that. They're, they're gonna take the theta and M and just fix it to one variable at time T. And we're not gonna model its evolution into the future of the look ahead model. And the same thing true with my rolling forecast. I'm gonna pick one set of forecasts over the future and I'm gonna lock them in. Now, if you lock them in, they become latent variables. And if you look down at the very bottom, they're no longer in the state variable for the look ahead model because you only put parameters that are evolving over time. So in the look ahead model, time is T prime. And if I'm gonna hold something fixed, it's no longer in the state variable. This is so widely done, we don't even think of it as an approximation, but it is. 
Now, let's say I, I've come up with a look ahead model that I can solve and I optimize it and I get a decision now. Then I roll forward, optimize, get another decision, roll forward, optimize, get another decision. This is exactly what we do when we use Google Maps. And with Google Maps, by the way, we're looking ahead deterministically, which is the most common form of look ahead. And if you want to be fancy, you're going to call that model predicted control. And there's a whole community in optimal control that does what they call model predicted control. <coughs> by the way, anytime you use a look ahead model, you're doing model predicted control. Now, this is me uh, sitting up at Hartford, Connecticut, trying to get back to Princeton, and Google Maps is running me right through uh, New York City. And I'm like, Google, you, you can't run me through New York City. That, that there might be huge delays. So I'm even going to use sort of a, a, a worst case, and that's actually a form of robust optimization in the look ahead model. Now, I can do stochastic programming and approximate dynamic programming. There are entire fields of research on how to approximate these look ahead models. Now, you can also do a hybrid strategy. So here I'm back to my energy storage problem. Now, I've got this high level of uncertainty in the future, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be like Google Maps. I'm going to do a deterministic look ahead. Now, there's my forecast, and that's my forecast of wind, and that forecast is terrible, okay? There's a lot of uncertainty in that. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to parameterize it. I'm going to throw a theta out in front. Now I have a parameterized look ahead model easy to solve, but I've got to tune those thetas. So this is work done by Saeed Gadimi. Uh, so the first thing is you can simulate the parameterized policy. And in the simulation, you're going to accurately simulate the rolling forecast. We're not going to ignore the forecast in the simulator. And so the challenge is to optimize the thetas, but now I'm using a simulator or a stochastic base model that doesn't make sim simplifications. I'm going to model everything, including the full rolling forecast. So this is much more accurate. I just have to live with my parameterized look ahead. So now my parameterized look ahead is very easy to solve. It's just like Google Maps. I'm rolling out and solving something deterministically, but it's now a, a suitably parameterized problem. Now, uh, Syed designed a, a nice algorithm based on Jim Spall's simultaneous perturbation a stochastic approximation method. I'm not going to go through the details. This is fairly st standard. Uh, we use a standard step size rules, gradient smoothing, the usual uh, work that people do in stochastic gradient methods. Uh, all of our gradients are done with numerical derivatives. Uh, now, if you run this problem on a perfect forecast, you would expect the thetas to equal one, and they are. The optimal theta is equal one if your forecasts are perfect. But if you use more realistic forecasts, now the thetas move away from one. And, and when you tune it, you get quite a nice bump. This is the percent improvement compared to using theta equal to one. So that blue bar, that is where I started with theta equal to one, ran my stochastic optimization, ended up with something that was over 30% better. All the others, I used other random starting points, sometimes got better. Uh, more often got worse, sometimes did about the same. Uh, I sort of like the fact that you can just start at theta equal to one and start your algorithm from there because starting points and scaling is really important. So let me just pause here and say parametric CFAs have been completely overlooked in the academic literature, widely used in practice, but in an ad hoc way. CFAs provide values, valuable scaling. CFAs move the stochastic modeling from the look ahead model, which is very hard to solve, to the simulator, where the research is hard, but once you're done, now the CFA is easy to compute. CFAs force us to think about how uncertainty affects the solution rather than hoping for desired, by, desired behaviors from a more complex look ahead model. So again, go to tinyurl.com forward slash CFA policy for, for more information. I think this, if, if, if somebody is young looking for a career, this is what I would do if I was your age. So I've just described four classes of policies, the two in the policy search class and the two in the look ahead class. Now I'm gonna make a, a strong claim. I claim these are universal. These four classes cover any method for making decisions that has been studied in the research literature or used in practice. In other words, if you're gonna solve a sequential decision problem, you are gonna use one of these four classes and maybe a hybrid. Um, so this is a pretty strong claim. 
but we have a tendency in the academic literature to focus on one of these classes and maybe a subclass within one of these classes without realizing that the others are there. I think it's time for us to open up and go, no, there's a lot of them there. Now, please go to jungle.princeton.edu, scroll down until you see this picture, hit the print button, pin it to the side of your desk. This is a one page overview of the universal framework. Now, I have to tell you that if you go out in the real world, Policies in the policy search class are the simplest, and this is what you're going to most often see in practice, aside from the deterministic look aheads, which is also widely used. But the price of simplicity is tunable parameters. If somebody says, here's a simple solution, guarantee you there's tunable parameters in there, and tuning is hard. I get a lot of questions about how do you search among these. Uh, 11 of my new book, tinyurl.com, R-L-N-S-O. Uh, it's dedicated to reviewing all four classes of policies, and it's got a section on how do you choose among these. Uh, and since I'm running short on time, I'm not going to go into this as much, but chapter 11, you can download it from the, the webpage, uh, will help you walk through this. It, it, it is a challenge, but it's better than simply ignoring the rest. Uh, here's my uh, simple little energy storage example. Uh, we created five variations of this problem. Uh, and then I created five policies, uh, one from each of the four classes plus a hybrid. And I was able to show that on, on these carefully designed data sets, each of these five policies worked best on one of the problems. And so, so I changed it and I, and I knew how to make the different policies look good. I claim you have to know all four classes. I mean, this is something that we, and, and for the academics listening to this, this is not how you should be doing your research. This is a teaching challenge. This is what we should be teaching our students. So now when we go back to our, uh, how do we search over the policies, the policy function class consists of the exact same sets of functions that the machine learning people do. It's one and the same, it's a one-to-one -one mapping. But then we have three more classes of policies, each of which are themselves optimization problems. So this is the search over policies. It's much richer, okay? It's like machine learning, but it's a little bit more challenging. So I'm gonna close by uh, throwing out to the academics. Uh, I think we need a new field called sequential decision analytics. We're familiar with the fact that we have a field called optimization. Uh, many books all using roughly the same notation covering similar material. Same thing with machine learning, probably a bigger set of books. And then there's also a field called machine uh, simulation. Again, very similar. Uh, you, you get a background in simulation and you come out with a, a core set of tools uh, that you learn. When you go to sequential decision problems, you go into the jungle. This is 15 different fields, eight different vocabularies, different styles, accents. They solve different problems with different tools. It's a mess. And Yet sequential decision problems are universal. This isn't something that only a narrow few should be learning about. So I have a introductory book, it's young. I will be revising it. Go to tinyurl.com slash SDA intro. I use this in an under, uh, in undergraduate course. It uses a teach by example style, but I'm very excited about my new book that will be coming out next year. I just submitted it to Wiley, so it's, uh, it's in press. Uh, this version was 900 pages. I don't know how it'll come out when Wiley is done with it. Uh, it, it covers everything. It's, it's at the same mathematical level as my ADP book. You need a course in probability and statistics and, occasionally, uh, and some linear algebra. You will occasionally need linear programming, uh, but I don't even think you need a course in linear programming. So I would like to challenge the academics. It's time for us to start teaching sequential decision analytics, not to high level PhDs that are mathematically sophisticated, but to a broad audience. And I'm including undergrads here, but also for graduate level, uh, and this can be masters. I think this, I, I had people from mechanical engineering, civil engineering, electrical engineering in my course. This can be taught to a broad audience. And I think it's a new teaching challenge as well as research opportunities. So if you go to tinyurl.com forward slash SDA field, uh, that's a web page on the field of sequential decision analytics. And my new book is available at tinyurl.com RL and SO. Wiley tells me it'll be coming out maybe May or June of next year. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Warren. It's a very nice uh, presentation. Uh, so let's open the, uh, the Q and A period. So are there uh, questions from the audience? Again, if there's any young people in here uh, and you need a new algorithmic strategy, one that has a lot to do, uh, but it's powerful and useful, look into uh, these parametric CFAs. It's a fundamentally new way of thinking, but it's already used in practice, so you'll never have to worry about whether anybody uses it. People are already using it just in an ad hoc way. I think it needs a lot of research. It's not a panacea, nothing is but it works on a very wide range of problems. Let me give a little example for, by the way, if anybody has a question, please. Uh, Google Maps, let me give you a quick illustration with Google Maps. Google Maps, you do a deterministic look ahead, but you use a point estimate of all the travel times. What if we don't? What if we use the 80th percentile or the 70th or the 90th? That's a tunable parameter. That's in the, the under, the, the lower level book, the SDA intro, I think it's chapter six, but I've never done it. I've never researched it. I've never done experiments with it. I think it needs to be done. Coming up with the right par parameterization is hard. Tuning is even harder, but when you're done, you have something useful. So we have one question, Eric. Yeah, I thought I would try to break the ice a little bit. Yeah. Thank you, Warren, for uh, the great uh, presentation. I really enjoyed. I'm wondering, uh, like, maybe you can uh, comment on the connections that you may make between the framework you introduced today and just the field of Markov decision processes as a whole. Would you say you're you're just reinterpreting that that modeling framework, or you think you're the modeling framework well, so you introduced today has distinctive features? A sequential decision problem is a Markov decision process. It's also a multi-stage stochastic program. It's also a stochastic control problem. It's also a multi-arm bandit problem. These are all just different words for the same thing. When you say Markov decision process, the problem is people all think that you're gonna solve it with Bellman's equation. That's the shift. Mm -hmm. I say, stop, no, model first, then solve. Mm -hmm. Once you say Markov decision process, everybody goes running to Bellman. And of course, we all know you can't solve Bellman's equation. So then you approximate. Now you're into the world of approximate dynamic programming. That's the mistake. Mm -hmm. That's the mistake. Don't do that. Model first, then stand and look at all four classes of policies and think about which one works best for your problem. Okay. But in the notation you introduced today, the notation is very well aligned with Markov decision processes, right? The notion no. of uh, transition functions, uh, state variables, actions, and policies. Let me argue. I'm wondering the, the, instinctive the MVP community doesn't really use the word transition function. They use the word transition matrix. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's, it, you won't commonly find transition function in the MDP community. Mm -hmm. You won't generally find X as a decision. And generally it's action A where A is discrete. But my X, I'm a mainstream OR guy doing fleet management. X can be a big vector. Mm -hmm. Go try to solve a big vectored value problem using any book on Markov decision processes. Okay. So I, I, I would say, yes, there's sim, but those same similarities exist in, in multi-stage stochastic, uh, stochastic programming, also with stochastic control. Uh, it's, they mm -hmm. all run together. I mean, mm -hmm. so I had to sort of pick and choose. Well, I like this notation from this field and I like this notation from this field. Uh, which is annoying because if you're an R guy, you really like X, so you'll you'll like my notation. But if you're an RL guy or an NDP guy, you like A for action. Mm -hmm. By the way, a lot of my notation comes from optimal control. If you go to chapter two of my new book, section 2.1 lists all the 15 fields. And then I have a little discussion. And I that's where I acknowledge, I says, my notation is closest to that of optimal control. The really key piece of notation is that thing called a transition function. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and open Marty Punham's book and try to find a transition function. Well, usually we talk about probably conditional probability distributions. So, yes. So I don't. I'll, I'll let the space for other questions, perhaps. So there, there was Michelle, and then a question from Christina. 
No, but I just decided to pass and to give other people the opportunity. I just had a small remark. So, okay. hi, Warren. Hi, Michelle. So, Christina, you want to ask your question? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, yes, so for the slide, uh, there was one slide on modeling uncertainty. Uh, the question is if you could give us a few pointers uh, in terms of what uh, papers or uh, websites or textbooks that we could refer to to get a, a good understanding okay. of those uh, points start. that you listed in your slide. If, if you oh, would like, start, you. With chap start with chapter 10 of my book. So chapter, so chapter 9 is my big modeling chapter. Chapter 10 is on uncertainty. And I, right there in the introduction, I say, look, this is a 30-page chapter that should have been 500 pages. There's an entire field called uncertainty quantification. So there's some references at the end of that chapter. Okay, It's a huge field. It's a big problem. When you go out into real world problems, you'll often find people who will say, I've had people just blankly look me in the face and say, I don't care about optimal policies. What they care about is a good model of uncertainty. Okay, and this is one of the reasons why the four classes of policies in chapter 11, uh, I have a whole uh, uh, section, uh, which is 11.10 on how to choose among policies and I have a subsection dedicated to the soft issues. So things like, you know, how hard is it to solve, it matters. I remember Google came down to Princeton once and said we'll take any policy you come up with you've got 50 milliseconds. Okay, uh, Google Maps, I mean, uh, these these transportation, these shortest path problems are all stochastic, but you can't sit there and solve a stochastic look ahead problem. It's just too slow. Okay. So that, that matters. Uh, there's also like transparency and issues like that. But when you talk about an optimal policy, how can it be optimal if your stochastic model is wrong? Now in deterministic optimization, we understand models are never perfect and optimal means whatever model you have is optimal. But in stochastics, you know, we have a tendency to say, yeah, but you, know, you didn't model the stochastics correctly, so your policy can't, can't be correct. It, you may not even have the right class of policy, depending on how you've modeled the uncertainty. So what I tend to find is that, you know, come up with a stochastic model, you know, a, a first cut, now come up with a policy, and let me call it a first cut, a good policy for your stochastic model. Now go back to your stochastic model and make it better. Now go back to your policy and say, oh, okay, should I, should I raise my game on my policy given the new uncertainties? And I actually think these two climb a ladder. So there was another question from, uh, and I'm sorry if I, if I uh, butcher your name, I'm sorry in advance. Uh, Zephyr Reza, uh, Rezania, you asked a question through the, the chat that maybe you would want to uh, ask it directly to, uh, to Professor Powell. People have to unmute. Thank you. You can unmute your... Uh... Oh, my microphone is damaged. Uh, okay, sorry. So maybe I can... Uh, well, the... the, the oh, the okay, question... hold on. So do you have any idea about how to model a problem about mines and the way to predict some factors? So every application is going to have its own rich set of issues, okay? So if you start talking about mines, I mean, that's a real world problem, which means you have very challenging forms of uncertainty, such as, you know, what you're going to discover as you do the mining, accidents that can happen, groundwater problems. You have all these different types of uncertainty. Now, what I find when I start talking to uh, people about uh, new applications, I tend to always find myself asking, my first question is, what's the decision? So optimization people all seem to think that the decision was handed to them on a plate. When you go to talk to people in the real world, you'd be amazed at how many people don't always know what the decision is. It's not universally true, but it's often true. COVID crisis, what's the decision? You know, you want a, a climate change, what's the decision? Mining problems, what's the decision? And so maybe the decision is where to mine. Maybe the decision is I know the location, but how to mine. Uh, so I was reading an article just yesterday on cobalt mining, and, and it's very interesting because it's very relevant to you know, current battery technology. 
Uh, I've been told that cobalt is not a rare uh, mineral. The problem is it exists everywhere on earth in concentrations that are too small uh, to be economical to, to pull it out of the earth. So uh, there's a lot of challenges that happen, but you have to sit down. First thing is just pull out a little index card and start listing. What are your decisions? What's this? And remember, a I've, I've had people where I say, what's the decision? And they'll say, oh, the decision is to minimize cost. I mean, I get that as an answer. I'm like, no, that's not a decision. That's a goal or objective. The decision is what you control. So uh, no less a star than Ban Van Roy, who I have tremendous uh, uh, respect for, I asked him to define reinforcement learning. And he defined it as, and he says, this is what he does in his class at Stanford. He says, first of all, uh, reinforcement learning is, is a class of problems of an agent acting on the environment to receive a reward. And then he says it's community with a class of methods. So he doesn't uh, equate it with Q learning. But notice how he says an agent acting on an environment. I disagree because maybe you only have one action. Maybe the only action is, is a hammer hitting a nail. Well, that's not a decision. You only have one choice. You don't have a decision. Decision implies a choice. So people sort of take that for granted, but I'm sorry, it's, it, it's not true. You have to have a choice and it has to be a, a, a human choice. This is the, the problem that you're trying to solve. So uh, something that I do in my book, uh, at the end of every chapter or exercises, I have seven classes of exercises. The last one called the diary problem. And in chapter one, you're, you're, you're invited to design a diary problem. And I encourage you to come up with a problem that's not too simple. And then every chapter I get to the diary problem and I ask you a question that you have to answer about your diary problem. And this worked fabulously well in my grad class. And it was great because when you have a mixed audience, it gives every student a chance to work on a problem that they're interested in. And when I got to the modeling, I would say, what's the decision? What are the metrics? When I get to the uncertainty chapter, what are the source of uncertainty, which can be really Nice. I actually had one company say, how do you identify the sources of uncertainty? And I said, you sit around a whiteboard with a couple of cases of beer and brainstorm. There, there's no formula for how to dis identify all the sources of uncertainty in more complex problems. Thank you. Are there other questions from the participants? For any faculty, I'm gonna start challenging the academic community. This material should be taught and it should not be taught at a mathematically advanced level. It should be taught at a broad level and that lower level book can be taught to undergrads. I'm gonna challenge you, name a student who goes out and, and solves linear programs after they graduate. The answer is very few. I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's just the reality is. Even the students we teach linear programming to very rarely. Uh, how many of them go out and solve sequential decision problems? All of them. It's the universal problem. We should be teaching them. But remember, uh, for example, with an undergrad class, uh, I probably wouldn't even teach VFAs. I probably wouldn't even get to it or uh, beyond some analytical exercise. My book has some really cute little analytical exercises. That you don't have to do anything on the computer. You can just solve it analytically. But I wouldn't emphasize those. I would emphasize the PFAs, the CFAs, and the deterministic DLAs. And you know what? Everybody has to do that. And everybody solving problems today, most likely they're using PFAs and CFAs. And occasionally the deterministic look ahead, but if you do deterministic look ahead, you probably still have a tunable parameter. And parameter tuning is hard and it should be taught. So there are one other question from uh, Mel, do you? Yeah, the simpler book, tinyurl.com forward slash S D A, hold on, intro. Let me type it here. And I think that uh, Mel had a, a question also. Maybe we can, after that question, end, uh, end it there and uh, invite everyone to, to the chat room. Okay. So the next, just so, so everyone knows, the next, uh, uh, talk will will start at uh, oh, where is my schedule? I just want to make sure it will start at eleven. Yes, Mel.
Thanks, Walter. So fantastic talk, Warren. Thank you so much. So I was also wondering about the difference between model-free model models and model I mean, model-free approaches and model-based approaches like reinforcement learning. People advertise that it's model-free, but you are advocating for model first and then solve. So can you also comment on the model-free approaches, sure. please? Well, let's talk about what we mean by model-free. Usually what it means is that I don't have a transition function. So in other words, you're in a state, you take an action, then you observe what happens next. So I actually did a little illustration of that in my talk today where the demand, I observe the demand, but I don't know how I got from time t to time t plus one. You just observe it. So my W process doesn't actually really exist in model three. You go from a state to an action to the next state. So you literally observe the downstream state. Now, in the problem that I illustrated, I was actually a hybrid. I had some state variables were model based and other state variables were model free. It's not an either or. So I had the problem where I don't know how the demand evolves. Uh, I just observe it, but I do see how the inventory evolves. Maybe in a climate problem, I don't know how the climate is changing, but I do know how the level of water in the reservoir is changing. So the evolution of water in the reservoir is model based, but what's happening to uh, storms and temperatures and rainfall is model free because I don't know the physics of how that's evolving. The reason why they say their method is model free is the Q factors. Once you estimate a Q factor, I can find an optimal action just by finding the action that optimizes the Q factor. I don't need anything off into the future. But you have to understand the oral community is a very, very large community. By the way, everybody, please go to one other website. This is my what is RL webpage. Um, the people who do reinforcement learning don't really know what it is. It's amazing, even, even top professionals. Uh, they just, they can't actually define it. Uh, that's why I challenged Ben Vendor. You'll see Ben's description of it. You'll see my tweaking of it. it. It's sort of a confused field. So I put reinforcement, but one of the things that you'll see in there is a section called a growing field. And I have a little graphic of how many times different terms have been mentioned in the year 2020 alone. Reinforcement learning was mentioned 40,000 times. 40,000 books and papers mentioned the term reinforcement learning spanning at least 20 different fields. And I list them in there. So I put reinforcement learning in the title of my book just for marketing and sales and whatnot. If you go into the book, you'll find I don't use the term very often because it's just one of 15 fields. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> this is a pure sales ploy. I also put in stochastic optimization. By the way, take a look at where stochastic optimization is in that graph. It's also widely. And both stochastic optimization and reinforcement learning took a huge jump between 2015 and 2020. So both of those terms are really skyrocketing, but nobody comes close to reinforcement learning, even though nobody actually knows what it is. It's one of those fields that back in the 1990s and early 2000s, it was Q-learning. It was one and the same. It was just a different form of approximate dynamic programming. And sometimes they do it model-based and sometimes they do it model-free. It's whatever, you know. Some purists will insist that RL is model free, but if you dig around enough of the papers, you'll find everything. But if you go, if you look at Sutton and Bartos' uh, uh, 1996 edition of, of, uh, of reinforcement learning, it's all Q learning, that's all it is. But if you go to the second edition in 2018, you will find all four classes of policies. If you know what you're looking for, you will see all four classes of policies. And I think, uh, take a look at simulation optimization. That's a field that used to be one class of policy. Now it's all four. Uh, bandit problems used to be just one class of policy. Now it's all four. It's everybody's evolving toward the four classes of policies. I'm just jumping ahead and calling it four classes of policies and identifying that they're meta classes. The, the new Sutton and Bartow book will have a CFA policy, but they only show upper confidence bounding. They just give one example. They don't call it a class and they don't identify how big the class is. So it's a true jungle. I've been thrashing around in this jungle for most of my career. Uh, it never gets better. 
Nope. But I hope you enjoyed it and hope that the faculty would think a little bit about maybe teaching a course, a broad course, not an advanced course, please not an advanced course, a broad course for, for many fields. And you can do it undergrad level and you can do it grad level, but not heavy math. This is for a broad course. I think bigger schools, you could get 100 or 200 people in your, in your class. I, I think this could be the most popular class, especially if you call it reinforcement learning. Thank you very much, Warren. So thank you, thank yeah. you very much, and think about that. Reach out to me if you want to uh, uh, think of the possibility of introducing a course. Great. Thank you. So thank you again for a great uh, presentation. Thanks, Thanks uh, all. Of you. We will open. Hugo, can you open the um, the, the breakout rooms if uh, uh, any of you want to uh, to join there and, uh, and continue discussing?